Cow. Good afternoon. I'll call this meeting of the Housing Finance and Policy Committee to order. Um, Representative Johnson, I, have you had a chance to review the minutes? Yes, I did. Uh, Representative Johnson moves the minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, members, we've got a busy week. Uh, we've got five bills up today, and the first bill is House File 2632. Uh, Representative Hussein, would you like to move your bill before the committee? I would like to move it. House File 2632 is before the committee, and uh, the motion is for this to be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Uh, Representative Hussein, to your bill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and the committee members for having me here tonight. And. Uh, House file 2632 is a stable housing organization relief program. The legislation in front of us was crafted by four of our largest, well-established and respected nonprofit affordable housing providers in the state of Minnesota. I own Catholic charities, common bond communities, and, and a project for pride in living. It aims of to recognize and establish critical nonprofit affordability housing operated to provide housing tens of thousands of vulnerable and the lowest income household across the state. The past three years of pandemic and the civil unrest and economic turmoil have created some of the most challenge condition in history for those nonprofit, Expensive for property insurance, property tax, utility, building security, provision and services has grown up repeatedly for the past couple of years. Despite activity and deeply working with the resident and the secure rental assistance through Rental Help Minnesota and other program, rental income has not been able to keep pace with rising expensive that we have seen in the state of Minnesota. These organizations and others like them across the state have had a hard time up property health and they have been sharing uh, through significant use of property and organizational devices which are being quickly exhausted for those incomes that they are going through. These challenges are expected to continue for the next eight years. If we don't address this and help for those nonprofit organizations who's helping for those community that needs the most in our state, they could have a difficult. This bill will designed to provide up to 4,000 per unit in one time relief for organizations that meets required criteria included, proof of nonprofit statute in the state of Minnesota, provide evidence of significant financial impact due to economic <coughs> and the pan pandemic condition over the last three years, provide some level of supportive service within their portfolio. And if you would allow me, Mr. Um, Mr. Chair, I would love to yell uh, for my first testify, uh, Mr. William. Thank you. Up next, or up first, we have Paul Williams with Project for Pride and Living. Uh, thank you, Chair Howard, and, and committee members uh, for the opportunity to participate today. Thank you to Representative Hussein for, for sponsoring this bill. My name is Paul Williams, and I'm the President and CEO of Project for Pride and Living. PPL is, uh, some of you may know, is a 50-year-old nonprofit affordable housing developer, property manager, and employment and training organization based in the Twin Cities. PPL owns and manages close to 1,600 units of affordable housing in the Twin Cities. About 3,500 <coughs> folks live with us uh, every night, uh, uh, nearly half of them children. Roughly half of our units are considered supportive housing, yet over 80% of our households make 30% or less of the area median income. That typically means that they're making less than 20000 a year and are likely coming out of the region's homeless shelter system. If we can help those households maintain that housing for two years, for two years, they are exponentially more likely to increase their income, expand their education, grow their career skill sets, and move up. Equally important, their kids are exponentially more likely 
to prosper. That's because housing is not a roof, it's a foundation. I'm proud to say that 97% of our residents meet that 24 month threshold. What we saw here in the last three years is the pandemic, the pandemic revealed that housing is health care. You were at risk of catching this deadly virus if you didn't have stable housing. Housing is education. Stable housing was critical to educating our kids from home. That's still a reality for some. Housing is workforce training. At PPL, all of our training programs shifted to home-based virtual models. That remains true for many training organizations. Housing is childcare. That's always been true as well. Like the many other nonprofit affordable housing providers across the state, we worked hard to help residents through this unprecedented time. Minnesota has among the most productive nonprofit housing sectors in the country. We are innovative. We collaborate well with government and the private sector. We deliver on what we say we'll do. However, the global pandemic and economic pressures we've experienced over the last three years, as you heard from Representative Hussein, has risked our ability to do so. Our 50-year track record is solid, but it has begun to fray. And frankly, it is now in danger of disintegrating. Insurance, utilities, property taxes have all risen higher than anyone had expected, including lenders, investors, and economists. We are experiencing increased medical needs, supportive services, and security costs as a result of the last three years. The compounding of dramatic cost increases and continued inability of some of our residents to pay their rent has translated into a loss of over $6 million in the last three years alone <coughs> for PPL despite accessing nearly $3 million in Rent Help Minnesota funds. We know that the pressures that we're experiencing didn't stop when Rent Help and the eviction moratorium ex expired in early 2022. We know this trend will continue for at least the next several years, and we simply cannot sustain additional millions in losses. It's simply impossible. As you'll hear from my colleagues here, particularly Nancy Cashman from Center City Housing in Duluth, They'll attest to that, to the, the experiences that they have had that have been very similar in many, many different ways. The four organizations that have brought this proposal forth, PPL, Common Bond, Catholic Charities, and Aon, combined have documented an anticipated loss of $60 million due to the severe impacts of the multiple pandemics we have experienced. In the Twin Cities, those four organizations are the backbone of new affordable housing development, particularly for those with the lowest incomes. When combined with dozens of other critical nonprofits across the state, you quickly see that we are the ecosystem of affordable housing production. We are the state's partner, the state's tool, your tool, for serving our most vulnerable citizens. I strongly urge you to support this legislation and will now turn it over to my colleague, Deidre Schmidt. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Is this on? Thank you, Chair uh, Howard and committee members for the opportunity <coughs> to speak with you today. Special thanks to our authors uh, for your leadership on this issue. My name is Deidre Schmidt and I'm the uh, CEO at Common Bond Communities. Common Bond is a nonprofit affordable housing developer, property manager, and social service provider. We were founded 52 years ago right here in St. Paul. Our service area, though, includes over 50 Minnesota house districts. <laughs> and uh, last night, just over 10,000 people found a home in a common bond community in greater Minnesota and in the metro area. The folks we serve are a wide array of citizens. They include in, uh, seniors on fixed incomes, families with over 3,000 children, and veterans who have served our country. About 500 of our residents receive a supportive housing model in a common bond community. Nearly 70% of all of the folks we serve have a household income that is less than 30% of their local area median income. And the average household income of our residents is under $21,000 a year. 10 years like 50 years for PPL, 50 years for Common Bond, 40 years for Aon, 35 years for Center City and Claire Housing and 150 years for Catholic Charities really speak to the resiliency of our organizations. We have evolved over these periods of time to be critical actors 
in the housing ecosystem that Paul mentioned. Collectively, nonprofits have delivered the majority of deeply affordable housing throughout the state of Minnesota. We have gone above and beyond bricks and mortar, bringing social services to help residents succeed in that housing. And we've brought millions of dollars in donations each and every year to privately <coughs> subsidize the construction of homes and to support people who aren't well served by the market and for whom public assistance is not sufficient. And we've successfully survived many economic cycles and crises. But what Paul described is a perfect storm. In the last three years, we've seen that the loss in rental income has coincided with incredible increases in some of our largest operating cost categories. We've seen ballooning in previously very small cost categories, and we've seen increasing staffing and operating conditions that make our job much more difficult. Now, affordable housing projects are not structured to withstand this perfect storm. At the outset of any new affordable housing development, our funders and lenders prudently ask us to prepare for somewhat unfavorable but sustained conditions. So typically that means that we're planning for 2% increases in rental income and 3% increases in expenses annually. And this has been historically considered conservative underwriting. But by contrast, I'll share a few figures with you from Common Bond's recent experience. Our rental income did not go up by 2%. In fact, as of today, our collections are off during this last three years by $7 million. Expenses did not go up by only 3%. Rather, over the last three years, we have seen in our portfolio 43% increases in property insurance, 20% increases in utilities, more than 10% increases in labor, 37% increases in security, and over the last five years, we've seen 22% increases in our property taxes. And in some of our greater men uh, properties, we've seen that number creeping closer to 30% increases in property taxes. Now, I'm really proud that Common Bond and some of our peers have had the discipline and the financial wherewithal to make up for these differences. Our residents and our properties have benefited. However, our resources have been drained. Our reserves have been drained. Our organizational operating cash has been uh, compromised, and we cannot continue at this pace. If we did, doing so, continuing as uh, on this current tra trajectory, without the assistance that we're requesting here today, would not only jeopardize our ability to be good stewards and own and operate the tens of thousands of units that we currently manage. But it would also make it much more difficult for us to consider doing new, de new development. And that's just at the moment when this legislature is considering an unprecedented set of resources for housing in your All Roads Lead Back to Home initiative. What we do is critically important, not only to the folks that we serve directly, but also to society and the economy as a whole. And that's why statewide organizations like Greater Minnesota Housing Fund and uh, Minnesota Housing Partnership have endorsed this bill. We want to be strong partners to the state as it undertakes the most significant housing initiative in the past 50 years. In order to do so, we need one-time assistance from the state to recapitalize our organizations and ensure that we can continue to play the essential roles that we have evolved to play. Thank you, and, and now I'll introduce Nan Nancy Cashman. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify in strong support uh, for this bill. My name is Nancy Cashman, and I'm the Executive Director of Center City Housing in Duluth. We, have some, we house some of the most vulnerable people in the communities we serve, with 947 affordable and very affordable units in Greater Minnesota, 743 of which 
our supportive housing for very high barrier homeless youth, families with children, and single adults. To round out the testimony given by Paul and Deidre, I want to paint you a picture of the impact COVID had on our properties. I think everybody knows that everybody went home. What did that mean for the people we house? It meant that all the safety nets disappeared and people with few or no resources were left hanging. We didn't go home. That wasn't an option for us. Instead, we had to readjust everything we did. For example, we had to close all common spaces and deliver three plus meals a day to each unit in our housing supports buildings. We had to get laptops for tenants to access any services they needed. We worked with every school that each child was in to coordinate their learning. We didn't want the children to fall further behind. We helped them get online for online school, which meant getting additional internet, more, more laptop computer, and really working closely with the schools. We coordinated meals and homework delivery with buses and parents and school staff. We supported the eviction moratorium because we know how important it is for every one of us to have a place to live, including and critically the, the very vulnerable people we serve. It was without question the right thing for us to do for our residents. As a result, our organization's health and property's financial and physical conditions have suffered. Very low income people have unique struggles and, and they just don't earn enough money to live on. So when they could keep more of their money without risk of eviction, that's what some did because rent help was where they could get the help. They can't get help with things like shoes, clothing, emergency car repairs, gas, phones, diapers, wipes, the list goes on. So some people stopped paying the rent. The balance of unpaid rent for some went as high as $25,000. Some tenants struggled with to recertify their Section 8 certificates, so the HRA payment stopped. There was increased damage to units for several reasons. <coughs> because of the stress people were under, we saw a lot of increased behavioral health issues. And no one left their apartments. Kids were home 24 hours a day, so not surprisingly, there was, there was a lot more wear and tear on the units. To keep the virus from spreading, we did not enter units in 2020 and part of 21 unless there was an emergency. As a result, typical maintenance was not done. It now takes longer to turn units and it's more expensive because of the condition they're in. As Deidre and Paul noted, the cost of utilities, property taxes, insurance, and supplies have all increased dramatically for us, as have staffing costs. Because of the lack of rental income coupled with increased costs and increased damage, we have had to use more reserves and like PPL, Common Bond and others, Center City has had to support properties to keep them running. We are still recovering from these issues and we need your help if we are to continue to serve those that we serve in a way that is in the best interest of all Minnesotans. We cannot emphasize enough how critical your support of this bill is to us and other organizations across the state as attested to in the letters from Minnesota Housing Partnership and the Greater Minnesota Housing Fund. So I wanna thank you again for your consideration and uh, we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Next, we're gonna go um, to member discussion. Oh, actually, th there is a amendment, the A1 amendment. Uh, who, who will be author offering the A1? Representative Dasseth. Thank you, Chair Howard. Uh, 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 Representative Hussein, uh, I'd like to uh, submit an amendment, uh, uh, the A1, real simple amendment, just that uh, basically that these fundings uh, actually apply to all entities uh, that need assistance. I think we realize that there's a lot of shovel-ready uh, projects across the state right now. I think that the, this would be a potential program that could apply to all entities that uh, uh, may need the assistance uh, uh, necessary. I think it's not just a nonprofit. So I think you find that there's, you know, with what we've just gone through with the pandemic, I think we've seen that uh, a lot of private entities uh, have experienced the same challenges. So I would ask that you consider this amendment. Uh, I'd also like to just add that I think it's, uh, we just did a $50 million uh, uh, homeless bill uh, that I actually voted in favor of because I see the necessity of that. I think we see a lot of repeat projects that keep coming through uh, and I guess that the uh, I'm just wondering why we're seeing so many repetitive projects, uh, repetitive uh, bills that sound the same, but they're just packaged a little bit differently. I guess that concerns me a little bit. Uh, I would kindly ask that you uh, consider this amendment today. Representative Hussein. Uh, Representative Dash, I appreciate it that you're bringing this friendly uh, amendment, and, uh, but at this moment, I cannot accept this amendment. 
so we can continue discussing offline. But I would ask my colleagues to vote no. Uh, Re Representative Dodseth. Uh, thank you, Representative Athena, and I, I appreciate your consideration. I look forward to working with you further on this. Uh, I ask why, is there a reason why we went, maybe acknowledge that uh, uh, private industry may be dealing with the same challenges? Now we are- Representative Hussein. Yep. Now we're discussing uh, to help the nonprofits who really need for this help. And uh, this bill is not about a uh, full profit. We're just trying to concentrate on our profits now. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Look forward to working with you. Thank Representative you. Johnson, sorry. Uh, Chair Howard, Representative Hussein, I wish you would consider taking this, mem <clears throat> members. We have a lot of uh, <clears throat> rental units across the state of Minnesota that need assistance. Uh, the way the bill is currently drafted, and uh, Representative Doss has forgot to talk, talk about on page two and line nine, where it changes it from 1,000 down to 250. You get outside of the metro area, we don't have many places that have 200, over 250 facilities. Yet those uh, are run by nonprofits. They need a lot of work, they need help. Uh, this bill limits who can actually get it. There's a lot of money in this bill, a lot of taxpayer dollars that are paid for by not only nonprofits and the rental units they have, and there's a lot of rental units run by nonprofits. But there's also a lot that actually use Section 8 housing that are privately owned. And this bill shuts them out. They need assistance as well. They're struggling as well. We are one Minnesota. We need to treat everybody the same. So I do ask that you reconsider and take this amendment. It's important, not just for the people of, in Minneapolis and St. Paul, but in all four corners of the state. Yeah, I'll, I'll go to vote here. I just want to make one comment. Th there is a, in terms of the one Minnesota, um, everyone treating everyone the same, just, you know, our for-profit rental units don't treat our, their tenants the same in the, in the vein of the rents that they charge. You know, our nonprofits um, are holding rents at more affordable um, and don't have that, that same um, uh, usage. And so I just wanted to add that. To, uh, but I see Representative Johnson, do you have a comment? Uh, as your comment that you just made, that is true but the privately owned ones aren't being subsidized by state tax dollars. All right, I will go to the vote. All in favor of the A1 say aye. 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 Opposed say no. 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 The amendment is not adopted. We will go to member discussion on House File 2632. Vice Chair Baje. Thank you, Representative Hussein. Uh, thank you for bringing forward this bill. Um, you know, as we understand, this is kind of a, a really serious issue, particularly for a lot of our uh, nonprofit house, um, areas that work with our lower income folks to have housing. So thank you for this. Um, one of the things I just kind of want to get a little bit of clarity on um, is understanding where a lot of the funding for this bill will go, just to make sure that we are indeed working to stabilize the operations of um, what's happening in, in these housing units and to ensure that all the, need, the needs that will be met through this through this funding. Representative Hussain or, or, or Mr. Williams or Ms. Sch Schmidt? I will, I will have the CEO come up on answer that question, Ms. Schmidt. Okay. Ms. Schmidt. Well, I'll, I'll start us off. Um, it, it's a really important question. I do want to say that each of our organizations, while we have experienced these same headwinds because of the location of our portfolio, the populations we serve, our organizational business models, have had different tools available to us to sustain during these really challenging times. And for that reason, what we do with funds that we would receive would vary by organization. So I can give you a little bit of a sense of what Common Bond would do with uh, resources that might be allocated through this bill. Um, uh, we would uh, start to replenish some of the cash advances that we have made to properties. Um, we have certain amounts of financial wherewithal that we have to keep ready in order to be able to engage in new development. 
And the more we put into our properties, the less we have that enables us to do new developments. So we would replenish those resources that we have put directly into our properties already. The other thing we would do with these funds would be to help residents who currently still have significant rent debt, who are still living with us, to resolve that rent debt uh, in a way that is appropriate for their household. Um, and then uh, uh, two other categories of work that we might do. Uh, we do have, uh, as Nancy was talking about, deferred maintenance throughout our portfolio and increased uh, call for maintenance. So we would absolutely uh, continue to invest in our properties in a way that um, would vary according to uh, the dollar amounts that might be available. Paul, did you want to? Those share? are all the same, it, Mr. Chair, Representative. Th those are all the same categories that we would use those resources for. I'll just tell you that a year ago, uh, if not actually a year and a half ago, we we completed a an inventory of deferred maintenance at PPL, 1,600 units in the Twin Cities alone, over 30 million dollars in deferred maintenance, and so. Um, so for us as a nonprofit, th those reserves are critical, um, but replenishing those reserves in order to, to, to even hope to kind of stay, stay current on, on those uh, repairs, deferred maintenance needs is, is critical. I, and I forgot to mention the fourth category, <laughs> and I'll let Nancy respond. The fourth category is that we need a bridge to the potential passage of 4D uh, property tax reform. Uh, so we have, um, at this point, an anticipated $8 million worth of property taxes that we will pay in between now and a conceived enactment of the 4D um, legislation that's pending again this year. Uh, so this would also help us bridge to that because those resources are ones that we would use to operate the properties. Vice Chair Gbaje. Thank you, Chair Howard, and, and thank you for those answers. I, you know, I really hope that a lot of this will go towards the significant backlog that you guys have talked about when it comes to deferred maintenance and when it comes to supporting the residents because you know that's the job you guys have been doing and have been doing you know really well in that space and so we want to make sure that the funding should it be provided continues to to work for those efforts so thank you represent petersburg uh, uh thank you mr chair and that does raise a little bit of a question uh understanding you know how budgets and so forth are made uh, if there is deferred maintenance, meaning that you, you chose not to do it, uh, obviously you must have had a budget for it. And so I guess the question I'm just asking, um, w where did those funds go to? Did you use them for something else uh, in the meantime? Or are there still some of those funds still available for continuing on with maintenance now after the fact? Ms. Cashman. Thank you. I think I think some of the issue is that the deferred maintenance gave us more things to fix. So the cost got higher. It, we didn't have enough money to fix where we're at today. Um, the, uh, the experience that we're seeing is the damage to the units is something <coughs> we've never seen before. And so there, it's the cost to just repair a regular unit turn is much, much higher than it has been in the past. Representative Petersburg? Uh, thank you. As a follow-up, uh, though I think I heard um, at least one of you say that you you didn't go into an apartment for a year and a half because of COVID, uh, meaning that certainly you would have anticipated some maintenance in that particular apartment or room uh, prior to, to that. And so those funds then weren't, weren't expended there, what should have been, I would have thought, available for future maintenance elsewhere. Now I can understand that the, the amount of maintenance may require more than that, but I was just curious as to where the budget dollars went for those that you didn't utilize. Ms. Cashman. Thank you. Um, so the costs that we incurred in a, above and beyond during the COVID that, uh, that, we didn't, that we don't typically have as a property manager, there were a lot of COVID expenses. We had increased staffing costs. We had really a lot of increase um, over time because we lost a lot of staff. So the staff that we had, we had to keep them working longer hours. And so we had a lot more other costs that that money was ended up being spent to. Representative Petersburg? Uh, Justin, so if I understand it right, uh, it, it got deferred to other activities that normally wouldn't have been done. Uh, thank you. I see Representative Johnson, unless anybody else. Uh, if not, I'll go to Representative Johnson. Chair Howard, member, I do have a question for uh, <coughs> Ms. Schmidt. You had mentioned that 
uh, over this last year, rent revenue was down. And I'm just wondering if it, if it was down due to vacancies in the apartments, was it down to people not paying their rent? Um, I'm just wondering why rent, rent was down, or did you lower the rent? Ms. Schmidt. So um, I would say that it's, a, it's multi factors that are causing our rent revenues to be lower than, than usual. So the $7 million that we have in rent arrears at this point is non payment of rent. So those are rent revenues that have not come in from units that are occupied. Um, we are experiencing, and I think we've compared enough notes with our colleagues to know that there is an increase in vacancy across our portfolios. And the story behind that really varies according to location. So we do have certain properties where um, the locations are seen right now as less desirable. And as we have a unit vacated, it's harder work to reoccupy those units uh, for a whole myriad of issues. Um, the other piece that is um, contributing somewhat to the operating difficulties we have is the difficulty in staffing that my two colleagues and I have all three mentioned. So um, there is an incredible shortage of maintenance techs. If anyone knows anyone who wants to be a maintenance tech at Common Bond, please call me. Um, uh, having enough experienced staff to turn a unit timely um, has been a primary uh, challenge for us. So it's not only about keeping properties up to the standard that, that we hold ourselves to, it's also making sure that as each unit comes offline from the last resident, that we can turn it around and prepare it to be a quality home for the next household. That takes longer. Each day, because of those staffing shortages, each day that that unit is unoccupied is a reduction in our rent revenues. What we do with our rent revenues is put them right back into the properties, in maintenance, in staffing, in social services in some cases. Um, none of those funds that we earn through the operation of our properties is paid out as a dividend or profit to an individual. Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Howard, uh, the testifier, thank you for that answer. Seven million in arrears. That was due to a ban on evictions. People uh, decided not to pay their rents. We had set up a program that uh, you could have provided your uh, renters that were behind for rental assistance to have that paid. And there again, it goes back to this amendment to open this money funding up to privately owned. They're dealing with the same issue. Yet we're going to use taxpayer dollars to bail the nonprofits out. I like this program. I think it could work, but it needs a lot of work. It needs to be opened up to everybody because these are taxpayer dollars. That should be going back to the individuals that paid them and not being spent everywhere. I, we got our budget targets just a little bit ago. And of the $17.86 billion that's left in reserve, left uh, on the uh, uh, books that we haven't spent already, we spend every single dime. So we have people that paid taxes, were overcharged, not getting anything back. So what we're going to do with the money? We're going to give it to nonprofits. People are struggling, our seniors are struggling. As far as I can tell, we're not even giving a dime back. We're going to continue taxing people on Social Security until we treat everybody the same and not give preferential treatment to nonprofits and other organizations. Why would any individual want to build a rental unit? I spent over two hours in northern Minnesota. Uh, this weekend, talking to them about housing issues. They don't have problems with Section 8 housing. 
They need workforce housing. They need senior living housing. Every bill that we deal with is for low income section eight housing. Now you might have a problem with that in uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul, but greater Minnesota, we don't have that much of a problem. We need workforce housing. We have $1 billion for this in this committee. And I hope we actually do some workforce housing and senior housing. Because if we get workforce housing, that means, and I, we're seeing that they have units that are open. People are moving out. Are they moving out for jobs? Or are they moving out because of the gigantic increase and explosion of crime in those communities? We need to really look at what we're doing. And I know this bill is gonna be laid over. <coughs> but we need to start prioritizing where our, the needs actually are. If we give, keep giving people everything <coughs> as a hand out, we're doing nothing for them. We're doing a disservice. If we do things to give them a hand up, give them a place so, place so they can actually get the job, get to work, get off the programs, we're making them a better person, giving them some self-respect. But as long as we keep doing handouts, we're doing a disservice to the citizens of the state. Representative Hussein, I'll go to you for kind of final comments. I do agree we need to prioritize where the needs are. That I do agree with. Representative Hussein, uh, final comments. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to address uh, Representative Johnson, your comments. We not handed out people. I'm one of those people that used to live in Carmel Pound for young age. This organizations help people prepare people when they need help. And many of us has lived in, in this public housing and now we are legislators. We own properties. We need to help people when they need help across the state. And I totally disagree with you. Uh, nonprofit is giving and discount people. They given uh, opportunity people place for them to leave. They are providing after school program. They helping, they building people. Where we have renters <coughs> is charging people full price and not giving back the community. And that's the reason why I'm carrying this bill because it's very important to me because I seen, I went through, and I'm one of those people that succeeded. And if you see some of those houses, uh, uh, apartments might be empty those people are moving up and they get in better life and they chase an American dream. And I want to urge all my colleagues, please support this bill. It's a good cause. And they do help greater Minnesota. They help in St. Cloud. They're in Duluth. We do need housing and we do need affordable housing in the state of Minnesota. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Hussein. With that, I will renew your motion that House File 2632 be laid over for possible inclusion in omnibus bill. And with that, the bill is laid over. Thank you. Representative Hussein, you can stay up there. Members, I just want to call attention. We still have uh, four bills left. Um, so we're going to try to stick to about 15 minutes per bill. Um, and so for testifiers, if you could try to keep your comments to, to two minutes, that would be appreciated. Um, if, if we need to, we'll kind of do the, do the timer to make sure we uh, get to all of our bills and all of our testifiers that joined us today. Um, just want to highlight that for some just housekeeping and time management. Uh, and this, uh, Representative Hussein, uh, would you like to move House File uh, 1214? Yes, I would like to. House file uh, 1214 is moved for uh, possible inclusion in omnibus bill. Uh, Representative Hussein, to your bill. Uh, thank you, for, uh, Mr. Chair, for giving me another opportunity. And I have a House file 1214, uh, which is a community stabilization project. It's based on my district. This organization has been accessed since 1989 with more than 20 plus years experience of property owner and the renters. This organization has worked with us and helped the community for many years. And I have experience with them in the past where I 
individuals forwarded to uh, uh, individuals that needs help, which had a, a problem for homelessness, and they were able to address that and give them a place for them to leave. And I, if you would allow me now, I would like to uh, call for my testifier, uh, Carlene Brown, who is the executive director for these organizations. Ms. Brown, uh, uh, Carolyn Brown, co-director of Community Stabilization Project, is our testifier. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chair Howard and the committee. Um, my name is Carolyn with Community Stabilization Project. Our organization has been around since 1989, providing tenant landlord advocacy to renters and property owners. Our uh, program take a holistic approach. We deal with renters where they at to help provide them for being homeless, keep them stable in their housing. We work with the property owners to reduce the cost of things like getting windows replaced, but we make sure that the units don't get evicted and they use their CO. Uh, we actually go in front of DSI, we go to housing court, we work with every asset to housing and that includes helping them get jobs. So some property owners need help. We have renters who need employment. We can get them jobs by making sure they're working with the property owner that's painting, keeping the properties up to reduce the cost to the renter, but getting the properties, get the renters to be able to have income as well. The other piece we challenge with is we see renters need, um, they lose their ID, so they're in the shelter. They can't get in shelter because they don't have birth certificates or security cards. We would like to create that piece of that program so that we're able to help them keep those our values safe in a place and that when they need it, they're able to get to it. Thank you. We will proceed to member discussion. Is there any questions from members? Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and in transportation and others, we're hearing a lot about the security of, of personal data and privacy and, and the amount of uh, need for a replacement driver's license, social security card. So I, I think that important is an important piece of that. Um, so how does how does that work? Are there going to be locker systems around the area? Is it only going to be in certain encampments? Or, or where would they have access to this secure locker space? So we would get a space. Um, we've been talking to different places. Um, for one of them has been the um, Rondo Community Land Trust. They actually have a place and they do space where they said we can um, create that locker space in there because they have all street parking, then we'll be responsible for having operational time. So we'll have a time to open, a time to close to allow them to have access to that. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, just one final question. If they have no real room, uh, no way of transportation, is that still accessible? Yes, yeah, so we can figure that out how to meet them where, where they at. We might have to go meet them to a certain place or go to a shelter or something. Thank you. Representative Hussain, I, I just uh, caught, caught your glance. Did you say there was another testifier? Yeah, I think we have uh, Dr. Bruce uh, might want to testify. Heather, please identify yourself for the committee and share your testimony with us. Uh, Chair Howard, members of the committee, uh, thanks, uh, Representative Hussein. Thank you for this opportunity to testify in favor of uh, the bill uh, uh, sponsored uh, regarding the Community Stabilization Project. Um, my name is Dr. Bruce Corey. I'm an economist and with the Alana Brain Trust, that is African, Latino, Asian, Native American Brain Trust. Uh, some of you might have, uh, I, I, all of you would have received uh, a communication from me and from us on the ethnic economies in your district and just in this committee uh, you represent 8.5 billion dollars of uh, our ethnic economies and we also contribute an estimated billion dollars in taxes so the, the context in which uh, uh, this request is made is around uh, that uh, framework. Um, the, uh, when I was the director of the Department of Planning and Economic Development of the City of St. Paul, I came in contact with Ms. Brown and the Community Stabilization Project, and I found it was a very effective project of uh, what we would call as economists reducing the transaction cost between property owners and renters. 
and at the same time addressing both the demand and the supply side of housing. So uh, helping and supporting uh, low-income people find housing, providing supportive services at the same time uh, assisting them as they seek to be financially independent. And so that's a very important ingredient of, uh, of success and I hope that as you think about uh, well, projects like this and uh, that you would think uh, of scaling such kinds of efforts uh, from this very small amount of this bill. Uh, I also am here because I'm also inspired by the work of Ms. Brown and I want to share an, exp uh, an example for to show how active and important she plays a role in our communities. Uh, I was grading my papers and a student said they couldn't come uh, to the assignment because uh, the student was sick and then re uh, re revealed to me that he was uh, facing eviction from his uh, home and uh, shared with me the eviction notice. And I referred him to uh, Ms. Brown and within a few hours she had contacted the property owner and got the uh, uh, eviction uh, stayed so that some deal could be made out. So this is real, this is effective, and I strongly support uh, this uh, Bill. Thank you. So state your name for the committee and, and share Al your testimony with us. Alex Smith, uh, Chairman Howard. Uh, I'm a longtime member of Ramsey County, <laughs> specifically Summit University and uh, Frogtown. I uh, had the opportunity as a mentor for young men who were just coming out of the prison system to uh, assist and, and guide them into a better life. Uh, what happened was that uh, we found out that we needed to do much more work with the families of these young men and that's where I became uh, integrated into uh, community re revitalization project. Uh, they, not only did they help um, mentally but they were able to find homes for these families. And if you know anything about uh, the criminal system, uh, we, we find our, ourselves in a situation where young people have nowhere to go and it appears that their future looks pretty bleak. So having housing through uh, community revitalization was significant in making our program that much stronger. And so I wanted to just let you know how much we need communities, uh, community programs like this, and uh, wanted to make my voice known. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions? Rep. Rep. Shah. Just a comment. Thank you, Chair Howard. Um, I grew up on Laurel, Englehart, and Dell. That's the Summit, Rondo, and Frogtown neighborhood. Those are my childhood neighborhoods. And uh, due to the um, housing um, options that were provided for my family, uh, we're able to get out of there uh, and start um, a different life. And so uh, thank you for bringing the bill forward, and uh, you know, good luck on this journey with the <coughs> program. Thank you. Representative Kozlowski. Thank you, Chair Howard and uh, Representative Hussein, and to your testifiers, I really want to thank you for bringing forward this this bill. Um, I am particularly interested um, and excited about the dollars that are going to go to just even the locker space for a relatively small amount that um, this request is before us is going to make a big giant impact um, in my community when we went and um, talked with folks who are experiencing homelessness um, we asked them if there was anything that you need what what would it what would it be and they said you know carrying bags and they've got uh, strollers filled with their items everything from <laughs> IDs to jackets to pictures um, everything that they own and they said I just wish that I had somewhere to put this so that I could go out and get the resources and get the food and and get the things that I need uh, go to the medical appointment um, and so I, I really believe in what what it is that you're doing here you know some of these uh, little stumbling blocks that might feel pretty little to us are actually end up being really massive and compounding over time um, so I just want to say thank you for bringing this forward and I look forward to voting for it 
Representative Hussein, any final comments on the bill? <coughs> no, just support this co good organization and serving underserved community. Thank you. Thank you. With that, House Bill 1214 is laid over for possible inclusion. Members, next we had House Bill 1705, Representative Cretia's bill. I think that Representative Schultz was maybe going to present, but I do not see Representative Schultz. So we could do a quick. Um, we could just we'll we'll go to Representative Perez Vega and we'll just we'll just swap those. So you're up. We could we could just switch if we if you want to. So first we'll have House File 1579 and, and then we'll, we'll go to Representative Cretia's bill uh, next. Uh, Representative Perez Vega, would you like to move your bill in front of the committee? Yes, I'd like to move House File 1579. House File 1579 is moved for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Please present your bill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of this amazing committee that uh, I'm honored to be a part on. I'm here to uh, talk about HF 1579, uh, give you some information on uh, relating to housing and appropriating money to the neighborhood house. The neighborhood house is a social service agency serving St. Paul and suburban Ramsey County, founded in 1897 by Women of Mount Zion Temple that opened its doors to Eastern European uh, immigrants, Jewish immigrants, and as the neighborhood house is a staple in <coughs> District 65B's West Side St. Paul community. It has offered more than a century of support in serving more than 15,000 people a year. Uh, participants are residents of low income, including immigrants and refugees. Uh, the main campus is on my beloved West Side community, with additional uh, locations far west 7th quarter, uh, three elementary schools on the east side, and one elementary school in North End. Those are the campuses. Um, the neighborhood house provides integrated holistic services, basic needs including food and housing stability, family coaching, youth leadership and literacy, early childhood education and adult education. And they're requesting $2.4 million to be used over two years to provide eviction prevention resources, rent, money for move-in deposits, utilities, mortgage support, and it's a great honor to have uh, members of the neighborhood house staff here to testify, and I want to pass it over to them at this moment. Gracias. First, Patty Paulson with Neighborhood House Stability, uh, uh, the Stability Housing Stability Program Manager. Ms. Paulson. Thank you very much, and we love having you as part of Neighborhood House. So thank you for the, the wonderful welcome and, and the comfort, and thanks to the committee for having us today. We are here to request $2.4 million over two years to, to assist Ramsey County families in avoiding evictions and staying housed in their homes. <coughs> we believe that with this funding, we'll be able to provide financial assistance to between 686 to 1,000 families over that two-year period. I believe that all of us in this room know the burden to governments, communities, and to the individuals and families that lose their housing and become homeless. With these funds, we can help stabilize individuals, families, communities, and the county and reduce trauma to the individuals and the children of the families that we assist. We believe that the best way to reduce homelessness is to prevent it in the first place. Neighborhood House is known in the community and our, our reputation far exceeds the west side. We are now a major player in all of Ramsey County. We have the policies, the procedures, <coughs> and the processes already set up and in place to utilize these funds that we're asking for. We were one of the agencies that helped distribute COVID relief funding during the pandemic. And in the last year, we were um, recognized as a key rental assister partner with the Suburban Ramsey Family Collaborative. Our program data tells us that 77% of the families that we provide one-time crisis funding to remain in their home stably for at least six months, if not longer. So our current model, we try to prevent people from even getting to eviction court. So families, low income, people of color, they have a force, unforeseen emergency in their life. 
So we try to assist them so that they don't even get the eviction letter. The second step is eviction prevention. I have a staff that sits in housing court in Ramsey County Housing Court for many hours a week. So we want to, as people are coming through eviction court, be able to provide them that funding assistance that they need to stay in that home. And the third thing that we do and part of this model is those that we can't assist during the eviction process, trying to rehouse them so that they are less of a burden financially on the government and the taxpayers. So all three of these areas do not just assist the families, but also the property owners and managers and bring families back to that equilibrium that we all need in our lives. So I just had a situation today where two of my current staff were able to assist a young woman who had been through housing court that we were not able to assist. And one of our programs is we also do housing search. So our housing search staff found this person another place to live, passed off the file to our crisis workers who then were able to acquire the money needed for the deposit and the first month's rent to rehouse this person in a very short amount of time. Neighborhood House is uniquely situated. We are currently the only community agency that is already assisting in a county housing court in any of the metro counties as we provide clinic services to the families that are going through a Ramsey County housing court. <coughs> we have been doing this for a few years now. This is not new to us. One of our current partners that we were having in Ramsey County Housing Court was Ramsey County Financial Assistance Services, emergency assistance. And due to capacity issues, their presence is now being withdrawn from Ramsey County Housing Court, which means we are the only agency left at Ramsey County Housing Court to provide these families with assistance. And we're very willing to collaborate with Ramsey County Financial Services and other agency partners to get this done. So at this time, if it's acceptable to you, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. David Herr. Mr. Herr is one of the staff at Neighborhood House in our housing stability area, and he is the staff that attends Ramsey County Housing Court. Mr. Herr, thank you. Thank you. My name is David Herr, and I'm a housing stability crisis worker at Neighborhood House. So. My time there is dedicating 24 hours a week to attend Ramsey County Housing Court. Ramsey County Housing Court consists of six hearing sessions where tenants are given the opportunity to seek legal services, financial assistance, or a mediator to determine if they can help with their past due rent prior to appearing in front of a referee or a judge. From a financial perspective, majority of the tenants are unable to meet our eligibility due to owing more than our program limit of 1750. Since September of last year, I've spoken to over 440 tenants, owing an amount over 2.4 million altogether. Out of those 440 plus tenants, about 10% of them were able to successfully meet all of our eligibility and receive financial assistance. Since testifying in front of the Senate Housing Committee on March 7, those statistics have changed dramatically, having spoken to almost 500 tenants owing an amount close to 2.47 million. The number of people I've been able to assist has dropped way down to 5%. Now imagine how much those, imagine how much bigger those numbers would be had I been keeping track of it since I started attending Ramsey Court. Now the reality of housing court is that I'm not able, I will not be able to assist everyone that I speak with. However, for those that I can and did, it was and will be a blessing. Now, with one of those, or out of those 10% was a participant I helped, her name was Lily. So Lily was a single mother of four young children who fell behind after giving birth to her youngest daughter in August of 2022. Shortly afterwards, she and her children all contracted COVID. And because of these two hardships, she fell behind her rent. Thankfully, she met all of her eligibility and we were able to assist her with her past due rent to prevent her from getting evicted. The reason why I share her story today is because there are many others who are in the similar situation like Lily who I couldn't help. 
the pandemic, for example, played a huge role in why people fell behind on rent. And it's really unfortunate when I'm unable to assist them, which is why I'm here with my manager, asked for 2.4 million over a two year span to increase our funding capacity to assist those owing over our program limit. And when you think about it more, we are not only helping the tenants, but also the property managers by paying them to keep their tenants in their home. If property managers aren't getting their money, they'll be in the same situation, same situation as well. Thank you. Thank you. Member, we'll move to member discussion. Are there questions, members? Not seeing anybody, so I'll go to Representative Perez Vega for any closing comments. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you got two mics up there for a reason, I guess, right? Two mics, man. Mic drop. So here we are. I just want to say thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. Uh, neighborhood House speaks for itself. The work, they don't just talk the talk, they walk the walk. It's over a century that they've been providing these services. It's an honor to bring this bill up today. I know these families that were the families that I door knocked on. And boy, the first thing they said is, help the Nave, because the Nave helps community and make sure that everyone is going home, and that's what equity is and inclusion. And I'm very proud of the work that's being done at the neighborhood house. We need to keep the continuation of great tradition in helping our communities. Thank you. With that, the bill is laid over. Next uh, up, we'll, we'll go to House File 1705, Representative Cretia's bill, and I believe Representative Schultz is going to present it for us. And I see he's brought treats, although uh, I've got to say, Representative Schultz, if, if you're presenting Rep uh, Representative Cretia's bill, it feels like he should be giving treats to you. <laughs> but uh, we thank you. Thanks for joining us. And, and Representative, because you're not a member of the committee, I will move that House File 1705 uh, be before us and laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Hopefully we don't lose the second mic. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the committee. Uh, I have House File 1705 before us and uh, I've got some priors with me. Uh, this is a bill that uh, would uh, provide some grants for land acquisition in central and north central uh, Minnesota um, in partnership with Habitat for Humanity, which does great work in our community. Um, like many areas and places in this state, uh, central Minnesota, Morrison County, and uh, Aiken County certainly suffer uh, from uh, lack of housing um, in across all ranges of, of housing, so big needs in our community, and, and Habitat for Humanity has been one of the great partners in our area, uh, providing for both the small towns, a little bit more larger regional uh, communities, regional cities in our area, and, uh, and so this provides uh, $1 million of, of appropriation in 2024 uh, for land acquisition in particular, as that has been uh, identified as a key need in our community. And so at this time, I'm going to uh, introduce Kathy Lane, the executive director. Maybe we could have. Okay. If we have a, okay. Let, let's try to go to that the mic over there. Thank you, Ms. Link. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Howard and members of the Housing Committee for hearing our bill for Habitat for Humanity in Morrison County and Aiken Counties. I know you are all fully aware of the work of Habitat for Humanity. God bless Jimmy Carter as he is in hospice care. Um, I am the executive director. I have many hats. I want to give you today a pulse on what a rural affiliate is like. I am the volunteer coordinator with the help of the finest board chair in the world. He helps in every way. Um, I pay the bills. I do homeowner services. I work with the families so they are successful. The unique component of Habitat for Humanity is that we work with the homeowners Give them the opportunity to own a home. And I will tell you the families that Morrison County has worked with and Aiken County, they are hard workers. Our last homeowner was a CNA. She worked through the pandemic. She works eight hours a day and almost seven days a week. And she is a gem. And she got the opportunity at age 38 to own a home and her and her three children are thriving in that home. And you all know home is stability for children. 
Um, and I, so I'm gonna cut to the chase today as to why I'm here, because on January 30th, when we were closing on Angela's home, I about panicked. So on your handout, there's a cost comparison. Um, that home that we built in 2022, appraised at $239,000. How can this be affordable housing? It cost us 170, about 178,000 to build it. And that was what her first mortgage was. So there was a gap of $60,000. And I said to Bill, how in the world are we going, is Habitat Rural Affiliates going to survive when houses are being appraised at that level? We have to make it affordable and successful for our homeowners. We teach them about budgets. We have them go through housing classes, through banks. We are the banker. We give them a zero interest loan. And Habitat of Morrison County and Aiken County, have we've been beneficial to raise enough funds. But how can I keep up with 60% increases and do fundraising? I'm the grant writer, I'm the fundraising event planner and pay all the bills and do everything. And I do it happily, but we need some assistance. So with this bill, if we could get money for land, we have purchased land before. When you purchase land cheaply, it usually comes with some problems with infrastructure. All of those costs we have to pass on in the homeowner's mortgage, of course. I'm going to let Bill talk a little bit about how we went to our local city council for some assistance as well. Good afternoon. You're welcome. Chairman Howard and the committee, thank you very much for your time. Isaac is from Uppsala. And I am from Uppsala too. So the treats are kind of a natural thing that Scandinavians do. So please enjoy, and I'm sure they were homemade. <laughs> <laughs> they they but, looked a lot like Thin Mints, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> they could have been Girl Scout cookies. That's then. right, that's right. <laughs> See, they're always donating to nonprofits. Thank you for your time. We have a different approach here. We want to get somebody into a home. We're going to build a house, but it's going to become a home. And that's what our key is in Habitat has been for, in Morrison County, 25 years. It took a couple of years to get established, I imagine. Well, this summer, in June, we hope to lay the foundation, the slab for house number 23. And that house will be a three bedroom. The one we just did was a, be a bath and a half for $178,000 with 300 hours of homeowner sweat equity. They have to put in 300 hours of sweat equity. We find another thousand hours of volunteer work. Well, there are some things we don't find volunteers for, electrician, plumbing, et cetera. I'm a retired painter. I was blessed to have the ability to paint in this house. And what we found is that the homeowner wants to help because this homeowner, typically speaking, is a single mother. The age will vary. The number of children will vary. But this particular mother, Angela, had three children. That's why we want, she wanted a bath and a half, two teenagers. She should have had two full baths, right? So what we have is a unique situation is we're building somebody up in the community. We're not looking to give something away. I think Representative Johnson used the term, and it's, we're not a handout. We're a hand up. We're going to help, help a person that previously has never owned a house. My mother didn't, never owned a house. She raised six of us. Pretty good, did a great job of it. She never owned a house, she never drove a car either. But what we do is have that opportunity to have this mother with her three children move into a house that will become a home. I was there just last week to put a couple of changes up. They're loving it, she loves her home. It's a home. So what we do through this Habitat Through Humanity program, as you mentioned, has been around for a long time. We were told by the city of Little Falls that Little Falls needs two to four houses per year to even come close to having affordable housing for families. Now, when you take a, a renter out of a rental situation and put them a home, what are we doing? We're opening up a rental situation, right? So we're doing that both. We're doing one house a year. As I said, we're gonna start number 23. One house a year. But look at, look at the analogy. Two guys walking down the beach and all this beach was all full of star, star uh, what are they called? Star. Starfish, thank you. And there was all kinds of them. And they were struggling, trying to get back in the ocean for life, trying to get back in there. These two guys were walking. One guy said, pick one up, throw it in the ocean. Pick it up, throw it in the ocean. The other guy says, what are you doing? There's hundreds of starfish down there. It's not going to make a difference. He picked up another one, threw it in the ocean. Makes a difference to that one. We're making a difference for one homer at a time. 
homeowner at a time. We want to make it two homeowners. We, that's why we need to get some property so we can expand our op opportunity to do that. The city of Little Falls, we went to Little, Little Falls Council. We were able to encourage them to ask them to lower the permit to get a house, just to build a house is three, four hundred dollars in permits. They adopted a policy to lower that permit fee by one thousand dollars. And of course, then you have a empty lot. There's no infrastructure on it until you build a house. So we built a house. Guess what? Fifty-two hundred and thirty-six dollars of, of an infrastructure bill cost plus sewer hookup, and water hookup. So there's expenses of that as well. Morrison County, we went to see Bat LeBlanc, our Morrison County Administrator, to ask if we could look into the possibility of acquiring some tax forfeited property. There's tax, there's property out there that either they don't want or they can't afford. I guess there's a state policy and I don't know the regulations on it or a paragraph or line, whatever it is. But that Morrison County, a county has to give the city the first opportunity to purchase that county land that's being tax forfeited. So we're looking into that with Matt LeBlanc to see if that's something that we could be able to acquire some land at a reduced price, not as the lot we just had to buy, $15,000, plus infrastructure, plus this and that and sewer and water hookup. I admire you all for the patience as you sit here and listen to us hour after hour. But you know and we know, and I think Representative Johnson, I'm sorry to keep referring to you, is that I think the word was eight point some million billion dollars of funding that's available. That's a big responsibility for you. We encourage you to consider our opportunity to purchase more land in Little Falls, Morrison County and Aitken County as well to get that starfish back into the ocean and get a homeowner, get a single mother with kids back into a home or into a home that they own. What do we do? We hopefully can enhance affordability and enhance wealth as well. Thank you for your time. Look forward to uh, having this bill included or perhaps even sent on to the House for inclusion. Thank you. Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I do hope that you include this in your omnibus bill. I saw that your target came out and um, you're going you're gonna to have some Sophie's choices to make, Mr. Chair. But uh, I appreciated the first testifier's analogy to or um, mention of President Carter, who I, I think has really set the bar as to what it means to be a former president and to actually just give very sacrificially. Uh, we've mentioned it before. Several of us actually took play, took, uh, we participated in building uh, of one of the Habitat for Humanity houses. And I, I remember, and Mr. Chair, maybe help me with some of this. There were two families that were in that little cul-de-sac that's in my district now. And um, uh, they were single moms and they came out and they had lunch with us. And some of the stories that we heard of just what it means for them to be able to, to own a, a place where they can call their own. And that, they, that is transformational. And I, I believe that, um, that there are homes that we rent and there are homes that we own. So I just want to make sure that we, we, we talk about that. But, but being able to sink roots down into a community with a sense of permanence is a fantastic notion. And I, I fully support this, this effort. And, uh, Representative Schultz, I, I didn't eat your cookies, and you know why, so I'm just going to ding you for not bringing, you know, some fruit to, to committee. But, uh, members, I really hope that we can support this and maybe, Mr. Chair, look at other habitat uh, funding opportunities because uh, I really think that there's a, there's a discussion that we maybe have missed somewhere along the way during our committee time where we're actually talking about building more houses. Um, and I, I think that if we could put more money into habitat and... Uh, you know, perhaps we all drive up to, to visit with Representative Schultz and swing a hammer up there. Uh, I think that that would be a lot of fun. Um, but I, I fully support this. I think that it's important that we all do. And I, I think that the families that, that met with us, um, and Mr. Chair, fill me in. Uh, um, I, I think there were, there were two moms that had, had moved to the U.S. from Somalia maybe within five years. I believe that was. That's around my recollection, too, yeah. yeah. Um, and just one of them was crying over lunch uh, by being able to own a home. And that was amazing. So I, I, I hope that we can put this in. Thank you. Uh, Representative Cha. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is, uh, what is uh, 500000 going to get you? One, two acres or um, just a question? Miss mm -hmm. Lang? 
Um, sure, thank you for the question. Uh, lots in Morrison County, good lots that don't have any infrastructure costs are about $40,000. So we as Minnesotans need to do better. We want to build more than one house a year. We need to build the two or four. Representative Shaw. Thank you, Chair Howard. Representative Hassan. He's not. Oh, I'm sorry, 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 <laughs> Representative Shaw. Well, um, you know, housing does not discriminate, right, regardless of race, religion, um, communities and geographical area, you know, and uh, I'm glad that uh, Representative Schultz that you brought this forward as you know housing is needed all over Minnesota just not in the Twin Cities, right? I live in Woodbury and we need more housing there affordable housing and so does everybody else in central Minnesota northern Minnesota So thank you for bringing this forward and uh, um, We'll be supporting your bill. Thank you Representative Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Chair and thank you, Rep. Schultz, um, or Rep. Kreisha, who's not here. Um, and thank you to the testifiers. Um, you really painted a picture of the real need for home ownership across the state. Um, I sound like a broken record, but I've been talking about home ownership the last five years I've been here. Uh, and, and why we need it. I'm also like appreciative of your program having no interest. The Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity started adding interest a few years ago. I can't remember if it was 2017 or somewhere around that. And that actually discouraged many members of the East African community or the Muslim community to not, you know, get involved in, in Habitat for Humanity. And I, I did have a chance to wear a hat hat and, and, and try to, um, in a very hot summer day, uh, try to see what building looks like, building a home looks like. It's a lot of hard work. I came home and all I did was like take a shower and just go to sleep for 10 hours. <laughs> so I have a lot of respect for people who build houses because it's a lot, it's a hard work. But thank you, This there is a real sense of urgency and need for home ownership across the state, whether it's my district, which is the urban core, or the districts that you're talking about in greater Minnesota, so thank you. Representative Kozlowski. Thank you, Chair Howard, um, and thank you, Rep. Schultz, for bringing this bill forward. Uh, broken record, but I also, too, support um, Pathways to Home Ownership, and uh, like your testifier shared, my mom also did not uh, drive in her life as well as own a home, um, and I have many friends who've lived in Habitat uh, for hum Humanity Homes. Um, my question is, uh, talking about home production, you know, I know there's the Home Coalition that has their, their slate of priorities of which Habitat for Humanity Minnesota is a part of, and I'm just curious, you know, in there there's $150 million set aside for home production. So um, why, can you just talk to us about the interplay between Minnesota Habitat and your local county and why we would um, designate specific dollars to the Aitken County and the Morrison County as opposed to Minnesota Habitat? Yes, um, I'll answer that twofold. Um, first of all, we had our bill in house first before Habitat Minnesota. Habitat mm -hmm. Minnesota supports us in every way. We look for them to be our advocate at, at the legislature. Um, we also want you to understand the pulse of rural affiliates. We run very differently than Twin Cities mm -hmm. Habitat does. Um, Greater Minnesota does not have emergency shelters. I get calls in my office for a week probably where people are panicking because they're being homeless. We had eight applicants this year. They all deserve a home. We, unfortunately, we can't build eight of them. But yes, we can certainly use funding from Habitat Minnesota. However, sometimes rural areas are kind of missed out on a little bit. Everything's going to the metro. And so we are here just to give you a pulse on what, <coughs> what rural communities do as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. thank you for that. And, and I'm obviously from greater Minnesota as well. Um, and I think having that, you know, you mentioned going to the city council, if there's local matches and different things that our cities and counties are doing to support, um, that's also really important. I also know that uh, in greater Minnesota, you know, you are in proximity to Leech Lake Reservation. We have a growing black Latino immigrant community. And so my, just my last question would be, I don't see reporting as a requirement, but could you just talk to about um, the populations of communities of color and underserved and how it is that you're working with them and making sure that they're also having access to these really fantastic um, opportunities, which I support. Ms. Ling. Um, thank you, Chairman, and thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we open up applications to all color. Um, Morrison County is 97% Caucasian. Um, but however, our last family, um, the three children were 50% um, of color. Um, didn't know that until we started building a house. So it, it's open to everyone. It's just Morrison County happens to be uh, predominantly a, a white county. Um, we are a county of 34,000 people. It's predominantly rural. We have a few large businesses, um, Airborne, who makes um, parts for the Mars Rover, is located in Little Falls. Um, we also have Wabash just starting. These families that want to come and work in Little Falls, it's difficult to find housing. I was talking to two realtors yesterday, and they're, they, they said if they had 20 moderately priced homes, they could sell them in a day and they don't have those, so I'll take this definitely a need. Does that answer? Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. I'm Representative Johnson. Mr. Chair. Oh yeah, Representative uh, Schultz. Yeah, thank you, I'll just add on, in addition to that, uh, Morrison County uh, certainly is a neighboring to the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, and uh, and so they would certainly be, um, uh, and, and so is Aiken County, by the way, um, and, and the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe has uh, part of their uh, tribal reservation is within Aiken County, and so it would be applicable to this, but this is particularly land acquisition. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Koselski. Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Howard, Representative Schultz. Thanks for uh, coming here today. I understand this bill a lot better now. Um, it was, and uh, Representative Kalowski also brought up a concern I had about the state organization. But this last week, <clears throat> I spent two hours up in Aiken talking with the city and county commissioners, land developers, and other people involved trying to figure out how to get some housing up there. They need workforce housing. <coughs> they need senior housing. The biggest issue they have is it costs more to build the house than the value. Um, I give uh, credit with the volunteer work you have. You've got the cost down. But generally in greater Minnesota, it's about $200 a square foot to build a home. In the metro area, we talked about the cost of homes, but when you get down to square foot, it's about 125 to $130 a square foot. Uh, you can see by the 22 housing, or built, house built by uh, Habitat for Humanity, and a little bit with a, a 21 house, you see what uh, the supply chain issue did dramatically, almost double the cost of the house from uh, 2019. And that's how much it costs to build. So we need more work to do. We need to get the supply chain fixed. But we also need to get homes built and figure out ways to do them at a lower, lower cost. Uh, because in greater Minnesota, they're struggling. They're struggling big time. Uh, they have jobs. Um, last Thursday, there's over 214,000 job openings with 70% of them full time. And in greater Minnesota, we have those same openings, but we don't have anybody, any place for anybody to live if they come into the community to work. So I wanna thank Habitat for Humanity for doing this. Their idea is to get the land so they can actually build the houses with the other funds. Um, and it's a way to help keep the cost down once they can get the land which is important. And I know the cities, especially the city of Bacon and the other cities, McGrath and them, they are working together to try to figure out a way to get some housing issues taken care of because it's, it's a major issue that if we don't get it fixed, it uh, could take, be the downfall of those cities and those communities and we don't want that to, do, that to happen um, because it is so important. And, and they are working with the tribe up there I just got a text from one of the individuals at that meeting yesterday. <clears throat> they are working with, with the tribal influences up there trying to work with them and leveraging everything they can to get some housing built because they need it in their community. Well, I'm going to go to Representative Schultz. We are really short on time, and so I'm just going to go to, I'm sorry, if, if it's a very brief comment, otherwise Representative Schultz. Uh, yep. We do a lot of local fundraising. We don't rely on a lot of tax money. We do a lot of local fundraising. We have a big day luncheon coming up April 1st. We do a golf tournament. We also do a church uh, gathering, and we go out to churches and talk. 
So we do a lot of local, and we're going to be meeting with those corporations that Kathy mentioned, Wabash, Pet Food Innovations, Barrett, and also uh, Airborne. We beat, the, we beat the streets. Thank you. Representative Schultz, a final comment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for your consideration of this request, and thank you for the time today. Thanks for joining us. With that, the bill is laid over. Members, we do have a little bit of extra time. We are going to hear our last bill, which is Rep uh, House File 2612, Representative Hassan. Representative Hassan, would you like to move your bill? So moved, Mr. Chair. The, with that, the bill is before us. Uh, Representative Hassan, please present your bill. Good afternoon, Mr. Um, I promoted you to speaker. It's a speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Chair and members, um, <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to present House File uh, 2612, which is $10 million, $10 million one-time appropriation for Urban Homeworks uh, Home Ownership Program. I feel like I have done my due diligence in this committee talking about home ownership, so I won't repeat the numbers or how Minnesota leads the nation as having one of the worst disparities in home ownership in mainstream and BIPOC communities. Instead, I'll highlight um, why Urban Homeworks is a great entity for home ownership. Urban Homeworks transforms <coughs> condemned, underutilized, and neglected properties into safe, dignified rental or home ownership opportunities for low or moderate income, primarily PIPOC folks. Urban Homeworks has focused on its primary, um, focused its work primarily in North Minneapolis and the Frogtown neighborhood in St. Paul because this area has experienced high level of vacancy and foreclosure rates during the Great Recession and they have only recently started to recover property values. I have borrowed this, uh, the following quote from their website. Um, quote, housing has been one of the primary ways that racialized wealth gaps have been maintained in our country's history. Our goal is to transform housing into redemptive force, not only for the residents or owner, but for the con co contractors, um, vendors, and individual and businesses that benefit from the development and management of the housing we work with. With that, Mr. Chair, I have a great testifier who will walk us through why this is important and we will stand for questions. Welcome to the committee. We'll switch since we got this little microphone technical difficulty. Good afternoon, Chair Howard and uh, members of the committee. Thank you so much for having us here today. My name is Asali So Young and I'm the Executive Director at Urban Homeworks. Um, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to present House File 2612 to you all today. Um, I'm also grateful for our chief author, Representative Hoda Hassan, and our co-authors, Rafa Akbaje, Representative Gomez, uh, Hussein, and Representative Noor. Uh, Urban Homeworks is a 27-year-old social justice organization that started in 1995. Uh, we started off as a volunteer effort to reclaim and create dignified housing, and we have since then grown into a fully staffed organization that owns, develops, manages, and sells affordable housing while maintaining trusted ties to the community through leadership development, volunteer opportunities, and tenant organizing. We own and manage 134 units across the Twin Cities. <coughs> Most of our purchases are identified by the community. Um, and then preserved and rehabbed through volunteer efforts and contracting with small BIPOC and women-owned businesses. We have also acquired, rehabbed, or newly developed over 120 units for affordable sale. 50 percent, over 50 percent of those homes have been made permanently affordable through partnership with land trusts. The remaining are restricted to 80 percent of the area median income. So today, as Representative Hassan has stated, we are seeking a direct appropriation for $10 million to expand initiatives pertaining to deeply affordable home ownership in Minneapolis communities with over 40% of residents identifying as black, indigenous, or people of color, and nearly half of residents making less than 50% of the area median income. These funds will largely be used for gap funding 
which is to cover both affordability and value gaps, gaps that are created from financing between the fair market value of a home and the affordability price required for 50 to 60% of the area median income. In recent years, gaps have risen exponentially. Public funding for home ownership has also increased and we thank this committee very much for that. However, no one funder will currently cover an entire gap, which leaves developers spending one to two years on average applying for funding before construction can begin and another one to two years before that home goes to sale. Because of these long application processes and timelines, <coughs> a home ownership unit that we applied for gap funding today may not see sale until 2027. And as a result of this, there are very few home ownership developers who are building deeply affordable homes at 60% AMI or less. Majority of our partners in the work, including ourselves, <coughs> focus on 80 to 150%, I'm sorry, 115% AMI because there's a greater guarantee that your gap will be fully funded. And so while this allows for a higher volume of construction, as we know, because you've all seen the data on the state of Minnesota, that is not hitting the target demographic or low median income populations. I could go on to talk about the impact of outside investors, but you are the housing committee. I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. And I know that Representative Akbaje has a bill that is working to fight this. So I'll leave it at that. Um, the average income, so while we are developing homes at 80 to 115% of the area median income, most of our communities are not at that level. For example, in North Minneapolis, the average income across all of North ranges from 40 to 60% of the area median income. And I have data that reflects that this is not just a Twin Cities issue. This is not just a North Minneapolis issue. This is a state of Minnesota issue. We are top four for the greatest racial disparities in home ownership. Minneapolis specifically is listed as number one for the greatest racial disparities of a metropolitan area in the United States. Home ownership is becoming harder to attain for BIPOC families who continue to receive income significantly lower than white families. On average in the United States, white families make 40% more than the average black family, and largely due to gains made historically from home ownership opportunities, white families hold roughly 90% more wealth than black households. How does that look in actual numbers? According to a 2016 Federal Reserve report, white families posted the highest median income wealth at $171,000. In contrast, black families reported $17,600. $17,600. We know that wealth compounds over time. We know that home ownership is often seen as this country as the greatest path to wealth building. We can infer from that reality that we all share that while that data is taken from 2016, in 2023, we know that the gap is worse. So we are proposing that this committee works to close the gap with the same determination and precision as the historic measures that it took to get us to this point today. Through a $10 million set aside, Urban Homeworks will be able to increase the number of deeply affordable homes for sale through rehabilitation and new construction. This appropriation will enable us to produce and sell homes at 60% of the area median income or to families making roughly $60,000 a year. These funds will be leveraged to cover financing gaps and allow us a nonprofit developer, nearly 30 years old, to increase affordable housing production without financial losses. We've estimated that with $10 million, we'll be able to develop roughly 25 to 30 additional deeply affordable homes in Minneapolis. This allocation is intended to grow the number of homes for sale in communities that have experienced systemic and systematic disinvestment and extraction. 
Target communities are communities that have been historically marginalized and excluded from historic home ownership opportunities, programs that have been intended to advance multi-generational wealth and have been previously impacted by predatory lending. This program supports Minnesota housing strategic objectives of creating an equitable and inclusive housing system by strengthening disinvested communities through deeper economic investment that more closely matches the depth of the inequity, creating greater access to home ownership and wealth building in black and indigenous communities specifically, and meeting the demands of workforce housing. And again, I'm just restating what you all have, you all have already declared are your objectives. Urban Homeworks has is a demonstrated history of moving families successfully through the housing pipeline. We start with stabilization, transitioning families from houselessness or high mobility to long-term affordable and dignified rentals. Once we're there, we engage families, partnering with them in community building, organizing, and civic engagement that leads them to greater <coughs> connection, long-term stability, and community leadership. And finally, home ownership providing families with home ownership options across the affordability spectrum. You have heard many requests this session, and we support those requests because a lot of them were made by our partners in this work, and we recognize that we are all seeking to eradicate the housing disparities that took hundreds of years to get here. Mm -hmm. But we are also recognizing that we need to increase housing stock for deeply affordable ownership opportunities because that reflects the data in its truth. We need a comprehensive approach to solve a crisis that has been allowed to flourish and persist. Representative Nash, you spoke to this, the need for a greater housing stock. This bill addresses that. Thank you all so much for your time today. Thank you, Chair Howard and to Co-Chair Agbaje. Thank you. We will go to, well, we do have uh, um, an amendment, an A1 amendment. Representative Johnson, is that your amendment? Representative Johnson. Chair Howard, that is my amendment. Uh, please present your amendment, sir. Uh, this amendment does uh, just a few things. Um, it requires that administrative co expenses for this cannot be more than 2% uh, of the appropriation to make sure that the funds actually go to the house <coughs> to get to housing. It also, uh, states that the appropriation is to be used to finance acquisition, construction, and develop of new units for home ownership, and that uh, there will be reports to the chairs and the leads of this uh, committee uh, through uh, uh, 2027. Representative Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Lee Johnson, uh, for this amendment. Um, I will respectfully uh, decline to amend uh, this amendment. Uh, we know that there is a re reporting requirement that Minnesota Housing Finance already does. Um, and then um, I know that the standard for administrative fee is 5% for most of the uh, nonprofits. So um, we can have a conversation offline, but I, at this time I will not accept this amendment. Thank you. Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Howard, Representative. Hassan, I'm disappointed. I want to make sure that this funds actually went for the acquisition of new housing units. Uh, the, uh, the way the bill is written, it's just, uh, just opportunities. It doesn't actually require that it has, that's what it's used for. I'm disappointed. I wanted to lower the uh, administration fees that keep it at a cap at 2% because that's still $20,000. <clears> that's a lot of money. And the fact that, yes, they do a report to Minnesota Housing Finance, but guess what? We don't see those reports. We don't know how things are working. So again, I'm disappointed. I, I would ask that you would reconsider, and I'm hoping that we can talk about it, because we need to start getting reports to this body. We are the purse strings. We need to see where the money's going. We just get aggregated data and high-level reports from Minnesota Housing Finance. We don't get the actual reports. I get, as a lead on public safety, 
every single body cam audit I received, every single license plate reader I, that audit that's done by every department of the state I received. The chair of the public safety receives it. These reports are important. It's the only way we can actually see what's going on so we can make the best decisions possible. High overviews don't give us that information. We need to see it. Mr. Chair. Rep Representative Sun. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair and uh, Lee Johnson. While I agree with you that we should get reports, um, we can have that conversation offline. But I want to put something on the record that um, there was a, a home ownership program that was presented right before this one, uh, Habitat for Humanity Ask. And there was no, um, no one in, 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 in this committee wanted to see a report from them. So I feel a little insulted that um, this uh, program is for urban core community, is for PIPOC folks, and all of a sudden we want a report because I don't know what the reason is. I'm not going to make assumptions, but I feel a little insulted. Uh, we can talk offline, but at this time I will not accept this amendment. Thank you. Representative Johnson, and then we'll go to vote. Uh, Chair Howard, Representative Hassan, um, it was my mistake because I didn't get, I didn't uh, catch that to get a notification to have a report put on there. I believe uh, we should always have reports. No matter who writes the bills, we should have reports. All those in favor of the A1 say aye. 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 Opposed say no. No. The amendment is not adopted. Oh. <laughs> My hearing works really well. So. Uh, we'll go to uh, Representative Hassan. Is there any other members? Otherwise, we'll go to Representative Hassan for final word on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, no. This is a great bill. Please include it in the omnibus bill. Thank you. Thank you. With that, House Bill 2612 is laid over. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.